Joe Wendler with ASME. Um, a lot of attention has been given to the SDOs and its, their business models today. So I'd like to put a little attention on the government. Um, prior to this provision being uh, passed, it was, this was introduced on the House side. There was a Senate version of the language that said uh, documents should be available to the public on a reasonable basis. And then uh, supporting that was the ACUS um, interpretation of reasonable basis that may include cost. It strikes me that as an interim step, that kind of language gets us to where we're going without putting FIMSA in the tight spot that they're in now. So I'm just curious whether you guys can comment on whether you might support some kind of amendment. I don't know if you can, but if you guys would support that as an interim step to kind of give SDOs and agencies a little bit of a buffer um, to help solve this problem. We, we have. The, the committee staff that's involved in this issue has been very cooperative. We've had a number of conversations. We've talked about a lot of issues. Uh, the, the, the thing that I'm sure I'm not lecturing anybody on in here is the ability to get a bill through Congress, especially Mike, with the, they can't hear you. They can't I'm hear sorry. You. Just maybe you can start um, again. Uh, we have been in contact with committee staff on this issue. They have been very willing to talk to us, talk about the issues, talk about what we're doing, how we're thinking of addressing it. Um, they want to know what we're going to do also. The problem is that even if a, a legislative fix were possible, the difficulty in getting legislation through Congress in the few remaining legislative days in a presidential election year is not very good. Uh, you don't have to be an expert to know that. It's, you talk about it in the paper all the time. So yes, yes, they are talking to us about what's going on, and indeed they asked us to have a conference call with them after we uh, completed this meeting today. And, and by the way, we, we are getting help from other agencies like NIST, OMB. We're talking to everybody. And, and some agencies don't see the problem because they don't have any legislation in, in this area. But other agencies are concerned also about what's going on, including you mentioned one bill that was on the Senate side that had the reasonable language in it. There were other versions that would have affected other modes of transportation that did not have that language in it. And one more question, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but um, you know, I realize there's the VEC case, but to what, what degree of consensus is there that standards incorporated by reference have the same um, legal force as law in the U.S.? I know there was a recent Supreme Court ruling in the Netherlands that basically said standards incorporated by reference are not law and they're still protected by copyright. So I'm just wondering, you know, I don't know if the folks from ACUS or others can comment on that. Well, we're, we're talking, in, and I'm no expert in this area, so I'll let others join in. We're talking about two different issues when we talk about copyright and what happens if you incorporate by reference. It's my understanding that if we incorporate a standard by reference and you are required to comply with it, it is law. Mm -hmm. But as David pointed out this morning when he talked about the cases, the, the, one of the major cases was referring to something that was written as a model law. It was intended to be used for that purpose as opposed to the kinds of standards that your company, your, your SDO, might st establish. Um, and I, I don't know that David disagrees with me, but our understanding is it's not clear whether that would apply to something other than something developed as a model law. You wrote it intending that it be adopted by states who can't claim they don't have a right to adopt it. Do you, do you want to add anything to it? Well, I would <laughs> It was, it was written as a model law. They still went to court and said, you may not publish it. It was still the view of the owner of the copyright that it couldn't be used. So from their perspective, they were still trying to protect their copyright. From the citizen perspective, it's still the law either way, whether you're talking about didn't a the standard. Court say, didn't the court say that they essentially waived their copyright? I don't, maybe I'm remembering incorrectly. They clearly, well, they, what they said was that since it was intended to be a law, that that was a factor that might, that might be considered in determining whether it would be relevant to, to or whether it would be appropriate to declare it in the public domain. Emily might know better than me. But um, it, to me, the, the principle is this. Are citizens bound to obey? They're bound to obey the, the building code of that town in Texas, and they're bound to obey standards incorporated by reference that are mandatory. So that's why I say the principle is the same. When, when in, in that case, in the VEC case, when they distinguished a few other federal cases, it wasn't, it didn't look really like obligations that, or, or technical standards that had to be complied with. It was more like a chart that you had or, or, or numbers that you had to meet. It was, it, the, in our view, most of the standards that we're talking about look more like the building code in VEC than they look like something that is advisory or purely uh, 
just some numbers or, or, or tables. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to, this is Emily Brummer again, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with David's uh, read of the case. The court was pretty explicit in distinguishing uh, cases that involve the extrinsic, the, the incorporation by reference of extrinsic standards. And they cited OMB Circular A119 there and said that, that you know, basically cases that involve that kind of incorporation by reference would not be covered by, um, or were, as they put it, distinguishable in reasoning and result. Um, and so I think that there, there is some ambiguity. And, the, and th that case was about 10 years ago. And there basically has been no further litigation. Um, but you know, it was an extremely divided Fifth Circuit opinion. Uh, most of the other relevant cases, I think, uh, go the other way. And so what would happen if someone, you know, if this issue really was raised directly, I think, is open to question. But um, if I were, you know, as a lawyer, if I were advising my client, uh, my advice would be that it would not extend to standards that are incorporated by reference in federal law. Um, but those standards, they do become law. I mean, the, the legal effect of an incorporation by reference is that the material is treated as if it were published in full in the regulatory text. Um, and that's the main reason that agencies do it, so that they can put the force of law behind compliance, or conformity, rather, uh, with that standard. So it's, I mean, it's a tricky issue, though. And we've got a few um, comments that have come in via the webcast that I'd like to share with everyone. Uh, Rebecca Craven from the Pipeline Safety Trust in response to, to your comments, Jeff. She says, uh, following up on Jeff Weiss's invitation to identify options in the conversations about budget limitations, it will be helpful as we try to identify those options to understand whether FEMSA takes the position that those voluntary standards that are incorporated by reference as regulatory standards remain protected by copyright. And if so, can you explain how they vary from other laws which are not copyright protected? I think, I think the answer that we just talked about that the three of us discussed, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll learn to, I think what we were just talking about answers that question. They still have copyright protection, we believe, but it's not absolutely certain, but they are binding law. And let's remember, this, there's been some confusion over this. I read the statute to only apply to the need for it to be available for free on the web if it's a newly issued standard after January 1st of 2013. It doesn't apply to it rules that we've already issued. We have two more comments. Uh, uh, another comment from John Conley. How would read only be used when providing training to a large group of industry personnel, such as now done by the Federal Motor Carriers Administration and many other organizations? What we can now print from regulations and on the FEMSA website would be copyrighted in terms of providing training on those regulations. How would this restriction to training materials for regulatory compliance by literally thousands of enti entities in the trucking industry improve safety? Described over the screen behind us. They just post it in front of the class yeah. from the Internet site. And another comment from Peter Strauss. Uh, the situation in Holland, someone referenced earlier, is that the regulations are performance standards um, and the Dutch standards were guidance, creating a presumption of compliance with the regulations and not law. Again, this is why the use of guidance in the statute is so unfortunate. 